Welcome to The Switch, not another podcast. The Switch is a collaboration between Baseload Capital, DNB, and Energy Disruptors, aiming to accelerate the green transition. We want our podcast to be a central hub for knowledge exchange within the fields of renewables and green transition. Hosted by Kristina Hagström Ilyevska and produced by Emil and Jacob. Welcome back to another episode of The Switch, not another podcast. If you are looking at this or listening to this, you probably already switched it on. Uh, we hope that we can switch it up one notch again with today's guest and episode. Guys, are you excited? Yeah, really excited. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, to that. Amen to that. It's quite interesting, actually, because if you look at it, we're going to speak to a person with a lot of experience in taking something that is good and introducing it to a new business and cleaning out the business. So it's interesting to see how she thinks about developing the industry of the boating. Yeah, really interesting, because development is something we really need to do to make the switch, generally, I think. I think. Agreed. What do you think happens to a company or a person that doesn't develop in these days? Oof, not much. It's like water. When it's still, it gets dirty. <laughs> we have, to, we have I... to keep moving in order to make a switch happen. That's what I believe. Just like a running river. Amen to that, Jacob. <laughs> Definitely. With that said, without further ado, let's kick this off. Let's check out the introduction of today's guest. She is the CEO of Exshore, a company that has transformed the electric boating industry. Green tech is one of her biggest passions and she has founded Summa Equity to inspire other people towards change and sustainability. In today's episode you will find out more about her journey and what she really thinks about politicians and leaders who doesn't walk the talk. She thinks everyone can be a part of the solution and lives by the motto, how hard can it be? Let's give a warm switch welcome to Jenny Keisu. A very warm welcome to you, Jenny. Thank you. I must start with a quote that I read from your website. It's amazing. It says, we're not here to reinvent the wheel, but rather to right the ship, to set a course for long-term sustainability that we can all be proud of. Please tell me more about this. What, what do you guys mean in Exhorts? So what we mean is that we think that people would love to be out with boats, continue to do that, to be out enjoying being part of nature without uh, transforming the way they do that entirely. So there are lots of electrical boat companies doing only slow boats or foiling boats, but that entails a totally different use case. We want people to do exactly the same, only better, both for the environment, better uh, user experience, and then we think that people can actually make the shift over to the green transition. And I guess that's why you actually came to Exshore, but I'm pretty uh, interested actually because you've had an impressive career, we heard about it, uh, going from uh, lawyer to some equity and now moving on to Exshore. How come you started here? Uh, well, that's kind of interesting, but uh, I love the fact that we managed to build with some equity and, and not only what we build with our portfolio, but most importantly, what we were able to push the entire industry to do. Yeah. So everyone had to change. I mean, they had to start talking about sustainability, start linking sustainability measures to the portfolios, etc. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like, what other industry can I do that? Can I really make this uh, push? Uh, and then my thinking was that I would be on the boards of a few different companies and a few different industries, which were very, very filthy. I mean, uh, um, maybe um, transportation, food, uh, maybe fashion. I mean, a few of the, I mean, uh, big, bad uh, industries. And mm. then with one or uh, several companies with trying to push these them. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was my thinking. And then I just realized, I mean, the further you get away, the more talking, the less doing. And then I jumped head start into uh, Conrad Bergström's project, Exure, and sort Do of started that. you want to push it? Yes. Oh, oh sure. there you go. So you're actually giving me an example here <laughs> yes. of, of corporate bullshit in sense. Because what, we're, what yes. you're saying to me here now is, I mean, you start 
started this summer equity and mm. you actually made a big influence on many yes, sectors but did. you felt what that no, the we, higher we, you climbed? Yeah, yeah i mean when uh, an industry started to shift i mean the private equity industry is doing lots of good things now we need to change others and and the higher up you get i mean the more board level the more talk the more politics and and the less things get done we need to walk the talk not just only be on panels and talking about it Thank you very much. I, ah, <laughs> we're pushing it very hard now here, definitely. But uh, let me let me ask you. But is that why you shifted to become? I mean, you you started this up mm, and then yeah. you moved to CEO for Xshores. Is yeah. was that a conscious decision that you wanted to affect more and to make more difference when you moved into this role? So basically, I. I found out that I like to build things and that is what I'm really good at. So when something is built and it's, I mean, uh, the, the house looks good, I don't need to refurbish it. I want to build a new house. Uh, so that's why I moved into Xure. And I felt that this is one of the most um, unsustainable industries there is. I mean, it's a huge footprint. Uh, everything in terms of manufacturing is... How big of a fit footprint is it today? Uh, it's big. So if you look at, we're in Sweden now, yeah. right? So uh, the Swedish leisure boating industry uh, emits around a third of what the domestic flights are emitting over a full year. And we, I mean, we only go one by... Third. Like, yes, one third. And we only go by boats during the summer, right? Yeah. And that, go, and I mean, that's one third of the domestic flights. Mm -hmm. So one summer with leisure boats uh, is like driving a normal car for three and a half years. So it's a big footprint. Uh, and honestly, most people need to drive a car. Most people do not need to go by boat. I need to do... <laughs> this on myself because I'm the one of those yeah. people who are actually driving a boat. And uh, to be honest, before I uh, met with mm. you here and reading up on it, I was quite blown away mm. uh, what big impact it yeah. actually does yeah. have. Yeah, and, and no one thinks about it. We think transportation. We think doesn't I mean going by boat. It's just something fun we do during a short period of time, which it is. But it, it emits a lot of CO2. A lot of fun, but a lot of damage. Yes. Uh, tell me, because it's quite interesting then, I mean, uh, aside from emissions, what, what advantages that, uh, does electric boating have when Lots. it comes to? So, of course, uh, it's, it's emissions and we also work a lot with sustainable materials, etc. But then if you look at the user experience, which is the biggest thing, I mean, you don't have any fumes, so no smell. You mm -hmm. don't make any noise, so you don't uh, disrupt and ruin marine wildlife. And also, I mean, uh, like driving an electrical car, I mean, the, it's very fun to drive it. It's electrical. Uh, I mean, it's responding instantly. Everything is connected also. So you can, I mean, uh, I start a boat with my watch or my app and similar. And, and since you have all of that, uh, I mean, the experience is just so much better. And, and also, it's, imp it's impossible to steal the boat mm -hmm. because it's always connected. You cannot drive it without the software. We can turn it off from Stockholm if we want to. That's amazing. It's quite interesting because, I mean, there are many lakes that, uh, for example, in Macedonia, where, mm -hmm. where I, uh, my heritage is from, uh, there is a lake, Ohrid Lake, mm -hmm. and that is a protected lake. And there are actually boats driving there. And there's a big fight about actually driving boats at all on this yep. lake. But this could actually be the possibility then mm -hmm. for a lake like that to be able to have boats of and course. to enjoy. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in most of German-speaking Europe, uh, Amsterdam, for example, they have already banned combustion engines on lakes. I'm actually surprised that we haven't done that already in Sweden. So if you look at Malen, I mean, that's a fresh water reserve. And, mm. and we are letting combustion engines run around there entailing that we put uh, diesel, uh, other fuel uh, emissions, oil strike into our drinking water. That's kind of scary. Yeah. Uh, how how is the uh, how is this moving along? If you're looking like development of this industry, in a sense, what's what's the next step for Xshore? So for us, uh, we need to scale our production. Mm -hmm. We're selling a lot of boats, uh, but we cannot build enough quickly. So we just started our second um, factory. Uh, one hour south of Stockholm in New Shopping. Uh, and there we will, during Q3, come up to full capacity on one shift, which is uh, more than 400 boats per year. So then we will actually start to be able to ramp up quicker. Mm. So that's, that's what we are focusing on. And then we're, the reason why we're bringing this in-house is that then we can do it without letting up the emissions, without letting out chemicals. I mean, as I mentioned, this is a very dirty industry. And if we do it in-house, we can actually do it green.
Do you have the support from the politicians and from uh, media, in a sense, in order to take these steps? I mean, it, it must be a quite costly investment that you guys are doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, interest from media, which is, mm -hmm. of course, great. So uh, we get lots of PR, um, especially in the US, actually. We're still very small in Sweden. Uh, we could, of course, get more from politicians. I mean... Uh, as extra, I mean, we still sell everything we can buy. So from that perspective, that's fine. But I mean, as a private citizen, I can honestly not understand why we're not banning combustion engines on boats because you don't need to go by boat. And I don't understand why we're not helping people to switch. I mean, look at the uh, recent reports that are coming out. I mean, we need to shift over to a uh, carbon-free society immediately. Otherwise, this will be, I mean, a totally unsustainable solution. We won't have a planet to live on in a few years' time. So I, as a personally, from a personal perspective, I cannot understand why they're not doing more. So, Jenny, tell us about the demand for your first boat now, Elix 8000. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have lots of demand uh, because the user experience is so much better than with a normal traditional boat. Uh, so that's the reason why we have such uh, huge demand. And we have that demand from uh, Europe, from US, from the Middle East. And we've already shipped boats to all three uh, continents. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now seeing also a uh, big demand from Asia, from Australia, from Southern America. So lots of demand basically everywhere. So our focus is to scale production. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to scaling this production, if... Is it difficult to make? I mean, if you look at the components in it, uh, what kind of battery, battery chemistry is it in it? Is it a difficult boat to build? Uh, it's a difficult boat to build because everything is uh, is put together by software. So the software is really uh, the secret sauce in this. So you have the composite, so basically the hull. I mean, that looks to be plastic on a boat. Mm -hmm. And then you have the drivetrain, so motor, inverter, charger, etc. Yes. And then you have the batteries. So that's okay. the main three so parts. So there are three components. Yeah, three. Uh, actually, it's like 600 components. But okay. I mean, in, in practice, it's the three uh, main areas. Yeah. Uh, and the batteries, we have lithium-ion batteries. Is that um, good for the environment or if you just talk about the batteries in a sense? It is. It depends on the battery, of course. We are using Chrysal batteries. Chrysal is a manufacturer in Austria, family-owned company, very sustainability focused as well. Their cells are coming not from China, but from LG primarily. So we're very cautious around how we source this. Uh, it's good that they are so uh, cautious around these things because that's actually the only battery that gives us high enough performance and also are certified for marine environment. Because I know that one of the like good things about your boat that people talk about mm -hmm. is that it has a good, uh, you can come up into high speeds mm -hmm. and you can also drive long yes. with it. And that, yes. be, that is because of this battery. Then. Yes, we need to take out uh, a lot of power from the batteries at the yeah. same time. Uh, and then we need high performance batteries to uh, be able to do high performance boats. I mean, I think that some of the people, not all, but some of the people might be scared. Right? Batteries mm -hmm. and water are not a combination that we're used to, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you did some interesting tests uh, to mm -hmm. make sure that these boats are safe. Yeah, and, and of course, it depends on which battery you're using. The ones we are using are certified for marine environment. They are actually classified so that you can sink them. And we actually tested sinking one boat in Europe and one in the US in terms of, I mean, making sure they are safe from the environment. So we sank them below water and then we pulled them up and ensured that all systems were working, shutting down as they should, dried up, and then you could use the batteries again. So we've actually tried this to ensure that they are 100% safe. Uh, let's continue talking about the different parts. Of course. Uh, so batteries, we've covered now, right? And then yeah. you have the uh, powertrain, which is uh, motor, inverter, charger, etc. And all of that is put together uh, with lots of software. So we are downloading 150 data points per second per boat. So the software is really the secret source, putting all of it together. Mm. Um, then you also have... Um, composites, which is what everything that looks to be plastic on a boat. I mean, what you typically see when you see a boat. And um, that's the hull, uh, and it's the roof, uh, and the console that you are standing at when you're steering. Uh, all of that are today made from subcontractors, and then it's made by hand uh, with lots of chemicals, not so nice chemicals. Uh, we're bringing that uh, in-house now in order to ensure we can do that without letting out any chemicals. Uh, with uh, so, Quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry to stop you here, because yeah. what you're saying here that you basically have a concept of a boat which you're not 100% satisfied yeah. with, but yeah. you're still developing it. Mm -hmm. Did so, I so it looks as it should look, Yeah. Uh, but we are constantly... Um, testing new materials. So we have built boats out of flax fiber. 
So okay. basically linen that you wear in your summer suit, for example. Mm -hmm. So we built boats out of that. We've also been mixing it up. Uh, we tried uh, PET instead of the Venusil. We've been doing this uh, for quite some time now to get to a 100% biodegradable boat. How much of your work is actually R&D, meaning development of, of what you already have? No, it's most of what we do still. Uh, it was basically everything we did for the first almost two years. And then uh, we started manufacturing and now we're scaling up capacity. So now it's a lot of manufacturing, of course, uh, but still lots R&D. And then it will be over the next few years, definitely. I mean, we're constantly improving, constantly making it more sustainable, more advanced in terms of software, uh, more uh, fun in terms of IoT features. Uh, we're spending lots, lots, lots of time on uh, R&D still. That's the, that's the biggest team uh, in XR. That's the R&D team. Very interesting. Uh, on that topic, if we move forward, what is the likely future of this segment of yours? What would you say? XR. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> but if you look at the industry, boating sector, when do you think we're ready? When, when are we... Yeah, we we are ready now and we need to be ready because we need to make this shift now. We cannot wait. I mean, in that case, we won't have a planet in a few years' time. And I think that people want connected things. I mean, they want technology. They are used to integrated technology by cell phone, smartphone or electrical cars, etc. So you want that user experience and, and you do not want to be out polluting the nature. True. So you need to have that. But then... Let me please mm -hmm. challenge you, yes. Jenny, because uh, I want to move into a topic now with a disruptive question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for the disruptive questions. Good choices are expensive choices. But nonetheless, we need a mass to reach the tipping point. That's why we need to understand when is extra ready to have prices that the average person can afford. So first of all, I mean, boats are relatively speaking expensive. It's more expensive than a car, less expensive than a house. So it's probably the most expensive thing you buy that you do not necessarily need. Uh, I mean, you're enjoying uh, being out in nature, that's why I buy a boat. So it's, it's expensive to start with. Uh, on top of that, new technologies are more expensive. I mean, you saw that with Tesla, you see that with lots of stuff coming out. I mean, uh, new um, TV screens, similar. I mean, it's, it's expensive at first. And then when we uh, scale up production, the prices can come down. Uh, and this is, of course, something that we hope to be able to do now when we are scaling production. Uh, so we are hoping that the prices will come down over time. Not likely on Elex, which is our flagship model. I mean, that's a super premium boat. Those prices will likely not come down much. Uh, but we hope to be able to, in the future, come out with more affordable models as well. When do you think that is? When is the future? It uh, doesn't have to be that far out because we're running really fast. I mean, uh, Elix we launched uh, about a year ago and, and I mean, we're still, we've already sold and delivered that to three continents and all of the scaling up capacity. So it doesn't have to be further out. Um, yeah, so Did you hear that, Emil and uh, Jacob? It's actually not so far away. You can soon buy your own extra. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Yeah, but, yeah. Hav but having but said that, it's possible to uh, do leasing uh, and, and similar. So buying an extra is actually not more expensive than, I mean, leasing a Tesla or a Mini Cooper or a premium car. So mm. it's, if, if you want to do it, that's absolutely possible already now. Can we, can we three split that? Or, or four, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> So we, the three of us want to split it so we can Absolutely. go on a list. We'll fix that. Okay, and since guys, everything is connected, it's very home. easy. I mean, you can just have the app, all three of you, and you have one key each. And you can see when someone else is using it. I mean, that's the upside so of having connected products. So when I see products. that Jacob is moving towards... Then, then, then you then, run. Then I run <laughs> to the boat and I'm going to grab it just in front of you. And I'm going to wave, Jacob. <laughs> I'm in. Are you ready for that? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, okay, okay. So we'll look into that. Actually... Quite interesting, and if I take um, uh, if I take this to the next level, then because mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, actually interested in just this charging part. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it from that, that I mean, charging needs to be an infrastructure in yeah. itself. Is Exure doing anything to make sure that we have the infrastructure so that we can charge our boats out there? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I have a boat, as I said, my guilty pleasure. But mm -hmm. where can I find those kind of 
So the infrastructure is actually largely already in place. I mean, every sailing boat basically is being charged. Uh, new, normal combustion engine boats is being charged when they are at the dock, despite being combustion uh, engine boats. So if you have a sailing boat, I mean, you have uh, AC, you have a cooler, you have uh, an oven, etc., and everything runs on electricity. Mm. So electricity is that that infrastructure is out already in place. Uh, of course, supercharging is being built out now, and we take that one as well. So it's not. Uh, I mean, from any perspective, a problem with charging today, although we are, of course, interested in more superchargers, etc. Will you guys be looking to build your own marine charging network? No, uh, we want to be a part of those discussions to ensure, I mean, that the hubs are coming out in the right places. I mean, 16 supercharging hubs and you have covered the full Stockholm archipelago so that you can go full speed in any direction. It's not much. Say, say that again, I didn't understand it. So 16, 16 superchargers points, yeah. uh, in Stockholm Archipelago. You have covered the full Stockholm Archipelago, so you can go full speed and don't need to figure out where to go for charging. So it doesn't take much to build it out. But is it going to be like when we go to Åre and then there is like one place where all the Teslas are standing in line and they're waiting for an hour? No, we don't have to do that because we always we also have the three phase in basically every marina. So you don't have that on the um, automotive side. Hmm. So it's much, much easier for uh, the marine environment. So it can actually go faster than so for the automotive? Uh, so, I mean, uh, in terms of how fast you are going, that does uh, only affect how soon you run out of batteries. But I mean, uh, it's not any difficulties for us because you can always go slow, right? So you never have to be in the sort of stress that I won't reach my target. The worst thing that can happen is that you will be a bit late. Now it's time for Conscious Questions. So tell us about what you have done for the planet this week. Or have you seen something really stupid about the climate lately? Or do you have any gl guilty pleasures when it comes to the climate? So I choose the first one. Uh, so last week I was in Singapore at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum discussing with world leaders, politicians, scientists as to how to get to this new economy, how to make this transformation into a green economy quickly. I really love that. So you actually took you, was it your team as well or...? It was only me, so we were two people from Sweden. Yeah. Uh, it was me and the CEO of uh, Swedbank Ruber, Lisa Jonsson. So you were representing Sweden? Yeah. High five on that one! <laughs> oh, thank God that we have people with us there. Yes. Good, good, good. <laughs> and I know that this actually moves us into the topic. Uh, we discussed a little bit before something that you are really engaged and frustrated about. Tell me about it. What, yes. what is that? Yes, we need to start walking the talk. Oh, I've said it so many times go. now, but I mean, <laughs> everyone is talking about it. We have world leaders talking about we need to do this and they are focusing on uh, we need to have all 20 nations agreeing on a carbon tax and similar. I mean, it's 20 nations emitting 80% of emissions. Mm. Why can't they just start moving their feet? Uh, we have corporate leaders saying we will do exactly what the politicians tell us to do. We will oblige. And I was like, well, you know that carbon is devastating for the climate. Why can't you just start doing something. I mean, every, everyone can do something, but they start. To, they need to start to do it now. They can't wait. What are, what are your top three things that you want people to start doing? So I want people to uh, start moving away from uh, fossil fuels mm -hmm. in terms of going electric, for example. Uh, I also want people to think about uh, food waste and similar. And I also want people to be very cautious in general as to uh, which companies they are buying products for, from or what companies they are working for. I mean, where where do you, where does your talent go into? Mm. Does it go into a sustainable company or not? Otherwise, you should probably switch. Did you get that? She said switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. I got you have it. it. Good. And actually brings me into uh, the next segment, a little bit about more the future and the leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are really a role model. I would say that you are actually an influencer in this area. You have been leading the path for a long way, but it could be quite tiresome, I guess, to be the one who is fighting the, the big the big picture all the time. How do you feel that you get the balance? I mean, you have three kids, you're really doing uh, a lot of promoting and talking out there. How do you get the balance? 
Uh, so f first of all, I mean, I, I really love what I'm doing. I'm seeing so much positive things uh, get done. So I get a lot of energy out of this also. And mm. I'm doing it for the kids because otherwise they don't have a planet to live at. Uh, and I mean, no one's perfect, but I think I'm doing a pretty good job as a mom. Right? I think you are. I am. Uh, but then having said that, uh, do not want to start a debate or anything, but just to point out, no one asks... This is a fierce woman, guys. No one asks male CEOs that question. Good one. We are in the switch, but I don't good, think that, good. that uh, I love that. it is... Most uh, people are not. I yeah. get the question a lot. Hmm. Very... Uh, I mean, I basically never hear anyone asking male CEOs that question. About balance. About balance, about kids. That's true. Yeah. But I am an awesome mom, that, so that's okay. I'm thinking of, uh, of the same feedback. I think it's relevant, but I think of it from my perspective, because I really honestly believe that the people who are purpose-driven, mm -hmm. the people who are fighting a bigger picture yeah. than some of the other people who are just going with the flow, it is tiresome, no matter if you're a man or a woman. I mean, there have been people here at the studio where I really feel that, okay, you are... You are fighting a fight for so many people, no one is actually thanking you for, for doing that. What makes you purpose-driven? Um, well, uh, I don't think we have a choice. I mean, please take comfort in knowing you did not have a choice. I mean, by 2050, we need three planets to sustain our way of living. Mm. I mean, I cannot afford not to do this. But also, I must say that I do get a lot of... Uh, thank you and i mean people cheering me on and i have the best team in the world i mean i have 100 people at xshore uh, all around me uh, i mean working for the same goal um, absolutely as passionate as i am so i mean it's not just me you're seeing me but we're 100 people so uh, i'm not alone in this i get a lot of energy out of that there is a saying that you have to be around people that are uh, driven in the same way as you do you feel that People are, get, are, we, are we getting more and more of us that are actually doing the switch now? No, we are, definitely. I mean, uh, we get thousands of applications to join us. Uh, and I mean, everyone, at least in Sweden and Stockholm, are now thinking about this and, and getting the right away. So I feel like I'm absolutely surrounded by a lot of people that want the same thing. It's a bit more tricky when you get into, uh, for example, these meetings in Singapore and, and globally. But I mean, more and more people are realizing this, that I mean... It's urgent. We have had the warmest five years in history now. Mm. I mean, it, it's difficult to deny this anymore. I mean, we've had Trump and a few US politicians trying to do this, but um, I mean, it's impossible to deny this anymore. So now we're actually seeing people moving on, switching to the right side. And one of the reasons for that is actually companies like Xshore, mm. uh, which I would like to elevate a little bit in the way you guys are working, because uh, my, from my perspective, I see a lot of technical companies out there that are not doing enough marketing in a sense. You guys have been putting a lot of effort and money, I guess, into marketing this in a very good looking way so that it actually... Um, Come, uh, so it, it actually goes into my heart in a sense. How is your strategy when it comes to marketing and extra? Well, so uh, the founder of Extra, Conor Bergström, is a whiz when it comes to marketing. And, and he uh, created a strategy early on that uh, we were selling a lifestyle. I mean, uh, looking at this from a bigger perspective, not only by this boat rather than others, but I mean, this is the way we should uh, become one with nature. Mm. Uh, and also we are targeting individuals when we are doing marketing, even though many of our clients are most actually are businesses and, and governments and similar, uh, we are targeting individuals because it's the individuals that make the choices. Mm. It's the individuals that have to live with this planet in a few years if we don't do anything. So, I mean, it's a very deliberate strategy, but I cannot take credit for it as Conrad Bergström, who is a whistle in terms of marketing. But I would really like to give you sunshine for that because Thank I you. think it's very important to get the tipping point so that mm. more people get interested mm. in it actually mm. because mm. it's not supposed to be a technology or an innovation. It's supposed to be a part of our everyday life. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I give you sunshine, but mm -hmm. I know that you have some sunshine to give to someone as well. Who would you like to send your sunshine to this week? Sunshine. Well, I actually would like to send it to Volvo because I think they've done so much this year. I mean, just going out uh, saying that they will only say ele sell electrical cars by 2030 and only sell those online. And they are doing this in order to get to uh, carbon neutral uh, 2040. So I think that is amazing. And it's a Swedish company leading mm. the way. Love to see that. 
I agree with you. It's quite in- impressive, actually, what they are actually doing right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was listening to a podcast with you, uh, What's in the Water, and you got some really exciting questions regarding summer equity and how we need to transition our mindset in order to just not save the world, but also save uh, or actually make money saving the world. Mm-hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, we've already uh, talked about this, but in 2050, we need three planets to sustain our way of living. That entails that even if we succeed with a 1.5 degree target or, or if we get to four degrees or, or worst case scenario, but, but still, mm. uh, the economy needs to be circular. So you can really think about how will your company look in a circular economy in five or 10 years from now? And for many companies, the answer is they won't be there because I mean, their customers might not be around anymore. I mean, we will have so many different um, companies that will actually be totally irrelevant. I mean, we are making the transition to a green society now, and that leaves a lot of people behind unless they are transitioning over to this. So it's actually very profitable from that perspective because otherwise you won't have a business in a few years' time. Mm. So it's profitable, it creates jobs, and it actually saves the world. So, I mean, I cannot understand why you wouldn't do this. I mean, who would invest in oil today with a five to 10 years horizon? No one. Who would invest in a car company only manufacturing a uh, car that runs on fossil fuels? No one. I would actually argue that, I mean, hybrids are maybe not something to invest in either. You need to invest in electrical, right? Mm. So, I mean, just looking at that, you can easily see that this is how you make profit in five to 10 years time. I very much agree with you and I think that's uh, a very important step forward because it's actually a shift of mindset that we need to switch from we can't do the old business models we really need to completely change or die Mm, exactly so do or die Mm -hmm. so with that said thank you very much thank you Jenny for being here and uh, we look forward uh, following your dreams thank you about that amazing woman Jenny and the company that she is running Xshore. I'm completely blown away about the actual fact that they are not only talking but they're actually walking the talk uh, by actually pushing both the public agenda the marketing agenda and also the politician agenda they are actually moving forward and creating a change a switch in an industry that is so much needed what i think we should really take with us is the actual saying when she says that we need to do good we need to do profitable and that's actually when it becomes great and that is also what we need to make sure to do in order to switch the way forward in order to save this planet and in order to push the agenda forward when it comes to innovating and working with green tech. I truly believe that Jenny and her team uh, are inspiring us to do the switch. I hope that you get inspired to do the switch with your team and people around you. No one is too big or too small to make a change and to do the switch. If you can do two things for us, it's actually to one, subscribe, Two, share this with someone else that you think wants to be inspired or can actually do a difference for many people out there. So help us do the switch, help us share the message. Thank you guys and have an amazing time until the next time I see you. Take care.